Thank you, Maggie, and thanks, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, is my, are my slides up? Can, there we go. OK, so this talk is on uh, Ayn Rand's Code of the Creator. Uh, this language, the Code of the Creator, comes from her novel, The Fountainhead. But uh, we find that many of the same points made, uh, she uses the word more producer than creator, in Atlas Shrugged. And I'm going to be drawing in this talk on, on both of those novels and on some of Rand's earlier and later works. Before I get into that, though, let me say a little bit um, about myself, about Rand, and about the other presenters here, and how we're all related, so to speak. Uh, and what I think, how all of this relates to the perspective, I think it might be best for you, uh, as the audience at this conference, to take on this, on this material. Um, so as, uh, as Mackie noted, I've just finished editing this book, or co-editing this book, a companion to Ayn Rand, and I've been thinking a lot about her. Um, and I, as well as many of the other speakers here, um, take her ideas really seriously, have learned a lot from her, uh, live by her philosophy, which she called objectivism, and think of it as uh, true as a systematic philosophy, as something that kind of puts together and gives us a kind of holistic perspective on the world. And Rand's philosophy is a really radical philosophy. It's a philosophy that challenges a lot of what we've been brought up to take for granted about how we should live, about what makes us a good or bad person, about how to evaluate others, about society. And it's sort of strange to encounter a philosophy that's radical. By radical, I mean systematic. It's not just on one or two issues. Fundamental, systematic, giving you a different way of looking at the world. And then it's that it's a different way of looking at the world. It's very different from how we are brought up to think. Um, there can be a feeling of, you know, do I get on board with or react against with, against from this whole different way of looking at things, a kind of through the looking glass kind of experience. And a lot of the speakers at this event are going to be coming from the perspective of having gone through that looking glass, of having uh, thought about this philosophy, found it to be true, and internalized it in our own thinking. So I just want to be upfront about that. We're weird. We're radicals. We're different. But I also want to name that point for you and note that that's probably not true and shouldn't be true of most of you here. Perhaps some of you have thought about this for quite some time and, and made that shift in your thinking. But most of you will have not. And a lot of you are here for um, you, you know, read one of Rand's books and liked it, or maybe you haven't read anything by her, but you're interested in the ideas uh, that are on the conference poster, ideas about value creation and trade. And wherever you're at and you're thinking about this, I want to encourage you to just not be weighing, do I make this, do I go with these crazies? Do I uh, reorient my whole way of thinking? and uh, join this brigade of people who are radicals and revolutionaries. Rather, if that happens in your thinking, it's something that should happen over time and gradually as you come to think of various positions as true and change your mind on them. The, the mindset I'd like you to take when you're thinking about my talk and about what some of the other speakers are going to say is just the mindset of being introduced to a new idea, new ideas singly and new ideas in a package, and thinking about, is this true? Is this interesting? What seems right about this? What seems wrong about it? How does it relate to other things that I think about? And then ask us questions. Think about it further. And put, for, put to the side any questions of, you know, what side am I on? Or how do I, uh, how do I process this whole? Do I swallow this system? Uh, do I think of myself as an objectivist or a strive member or this or a, that or a libertarian or a conservative or all the labels? Just think about the world, think about your experience, think about how these ideas match up with it, and the other stuff will take care of itself as you think about that. It'll happen later. Okay, that said, uh, I said Rand was a radical, so let me start with what I think is central to the radicalism, and that'll lead to the main content of my talk today. Think about how we're taught to think about morality, how we, in fact, do think of morality. 
I think for most of us, the way most of us are brought up, maybe not everyone, morality functions as kind of like a stop sign in your thinking. It's something that says, halt, don't do this, thou shalt not. It's something that puts limits on you. There's what you want, there's what would be good for you, and then there's places you can't go, shouldn't go in pursuing that. It's a limit, it's a constraint. And that's a view of morality that Ayn Rand is challenging and that I'd like us to think about challenging ourselves. To illustrate how pervasive this uh, stop sign view of morality, this view of morality as a limit or constraint is, I want to just tell you about an assignment I sometimes give in ethics classes. I give this assignment at the very beginning of a course on ethics or at the very beginning of a unit on ethics in another course, before any of the students have read ethics, before we've talked about any ethical philosophers. And I just sometimes ask them to, uh, in a brief paragraph, describe the sort of life they would live if they made their own self-interest their highest priority in life, placing no considerations above it. Just a paragraph, just write a f you know, few sentences about what kind of a life that would be, how you yourself would lead your life if you were placing nothing above your own self-interest, your own happiness. And then I ask them to write a second paragraph where they describe the kind of life they would lead if they placed no consideration above being moral, if they made morality their priority in life. And then finally, a third short paragraph, how do these two lives relate? And what I find whenever I give this assignment, and I've given it a lot over the years, is not everyone, but a significant percentage of the students say that the two lives are opposite to one another. The moral life is a life in which they don't do any of the things they would have done in the, in the self-interested life. Even the students who don't say that, though, what I notice most when I give this assignment, because what I just said is what I was expecting to find when I gave it, but what I notice most when I give this assignment is how little people have to say in answer to the first question. It's always something like, I'd have a lot of stuff or a big house or I just rob banks. Uh, and if you take a little bit of thought about what kind of a life that would be, um, even not thinking very deeply about your relationships to people, just you know how likely you are to get away with robbing the banks, for example, which isn't the only reason not to rob them. But, uh, you know, it's just, it pretty much collapses. And maybe it's the students not taking the assignment seriously, but I don't think it's all that it is. Because when I probe them about it, it becomes clear that they just haven't really thought about what they want out of life, what their own self-interest would be. And this is something that Rand noticed and she found very sad. She thinks, or thought, to a large extent that it was an effect of this stop sign view of morality. This view that says what's good is not what's good for you, not what will make your life the best it can be, but something else that detracts from and limits that. Don't go there. Don't go to what you want out of your life, what you can make of your life. And so don't even think about it. And in her view, most people didn't think about it, haven't thought about it enough. And this moral theory that we share, which she calls the morality of sacrifice, the idea that morality is about giving up. It's also called altruism. Um, this view is one of the main contributing causes of that. And again, she found this sad, and it was something that she was trying to combat. Why? Well, what's wrong with it? Part of the issue is, as a young woman, she was somebody who wanted to be a novelist. She was excited by heroes. She was excited by people who were ambitious, exciting, admirable, doing great things, and were really passionate about what they were doing. The kind of characters that she met in the romantic novels that she loved, and the novels that she was projecting writing herself. And as she looked at a lot of the people around her, she thought, too few people are like this. Too few people have a real drive, a re something they're really after. Uh, if you ask people, what do you want out of life? What would your self-interest be? Most people have very little to say. Maybe just whatever I feel like at the moment, but what you feel like at the moment is changes from moment to moment, so that if you pursue it, it doesn't add up to anything. Somebody who has a real view of their self-interest, of what they want out of life, has something that's enduring from moment to moment, year to year. 
something that their life adds up to and that they're working to achieve in every hour and every moment of their lives, and something that they feel a great intensity about. Think about, again, the heroes of Rand's novels or of any other novel where you, you think of a character as someone you know, striving for something great over time. That thing is really important to them. Or again, think of somebody like a Steve Jobs. But too many people don't have that or don't have that enough, she thought. We all can, but too many of us don't. And again, one of the causes is this morality. Moreover, when you have this morality that says, don't try to find out, discover, create what's best for yourself, and then don't try to perceive, make your life about that, you get a kind of defeatist, not caring too much about yourself or others mentality. A mentality where you're willing to let other things happen to you, where you're willing to just kind of go with the flow, where you're willing to give up and sacrifice with sometimes horrific results. And Rand saw, for example, the rise of communism in Russia. She grew up in Russia. And she was worried about the rise of similar ideas here. It leads us to accept all kinds of injustices, to sacrifice, to give up too much, and to not be concerned about the sacrifices demand against, demanded by others, to not take our own lives seriously, because we don't even know what those own lives are, what we want out of them. So Rand was concerned with opposing this, with defining an alternative to it. Her first novel, We the Living, is set in Russia. And it's about the difference between certain characters who do take their lives seriously, who care about their lives, who define what they want out of them, and the characters who don't, and the effects of the Russian society, the totalitarian government, on especially the people who do project goals. And that's what the title means, We the Living, because her idea, and this idea isn't actually original to her, but it's an idea she really develops, I think, with great force, is that it's only insofar as one does this, insofar as one wants and figures out what one wants and values and projects over time and goes after things with a passion and with a passionate thought process about it, that one's really in the human sense alive. And so the heroine of the novel says in a climactic speech, what do you think is living in me? Why do you think I'm alive? Is it because I have a stomach and eat and digest the food? Is it because I breathe and work to produce more food to digest? Or is it because I know what I want? And that something which knows how to want isn't that life itself. And what Rand's trying to do in a lot of her work, what I think her work does, is foster that thing in you which knows how to want, which knows how to answer that first question in the assignment I gave, which thinks seriously about what you want out of life and how to get it, and which leads to your having intense, passionate, strong feelings about what you want out of life, of really enjoying it when you get it, of feeling the sting when you have a setback, but then having that motivate you to work to achieve the thing. That's what's alive in you, not the fact that you have a stomach and eat and have the desire to eat now. That's what's alive in you in the human sense. That's her perspective. And I want to follow this through a few of her other books and then bring out a little bit of the more technical points behind it. But what I hope you'll get from this conference is that perspective, that perspective of the thing in you that's alive is the thing that knows how to want, knows how to value, as she puts it elsewhere and to think about how you can help foster and build and grow that thing in yourself. And I think a lot of the talks in one way or another throughout the weekend um, talk about that and talk in, in particular about how to foster that in yourself, give you techniques, advice on how to do it. Moving now to her next novel, The Fountainhead, there Rand draws a distinction between people who do have this thing in themselves, the thing that knows how to want, that have developed and live by this thing, the people who are living in, the se in this human sense of the word, and people who are not. The people who are not, she says, live only secondhand. If life is about wanting things, is about valuing things, is about directing yourself towards goals, selecting, figuring out, coming up with a goal for yourself, a goal for your life, and then working towards it. If that's what life is about, and if most people don't do that, or many people don't do it, and most people don't do it enough, then what's going on in the other people? Well, they're not living for themselves. 
They're not living their own lives. Rather, what they do, the goals they have, the ideas they have, are effects of other people. Other people have done this. Other people have done the work of living, the internal work, the psychological work of living. And if you don't, what you end up doing is living secondhand, being a secondhander, as she puts it. That is, having your days and hours animated by the after effects of the thinking of others. And the contrast between the second-handers and what she calls the creators is the theme of the fountainhead. The creators are people who do what? Well, they engage in this process of living. And what is it? It's a process of thinking, of formulating goals. And these goals lead to new ideas for things you can achieve in your life. They make your life about something. And the creators, because of that, are the people who create the hero is a builder who designs innovative new buildings and who has a great passion for that. Uh, but the idea is that there is something similar in any career, in any life that you can have. Now let me turn to another aspect of the Fountainhead that I want to tie into this. The hero of the novel is Howard Rourke, and Howard Rourke is an innovative architect of what's come to be called the modernist tradition, although that's not how he would think about it. He's someone in his architectural convictions like Frank Lloyd Wright. And what he prizes in architecture is integrity, is the building being integrated, all the components forming a sensible, coherent whole. He thinks that's what makes a building, a, a building beautiful and comprehensible as opposed to a building that has elements taken from other buildings you've seen that don't fit together, a kind of incongruous mess. Let me read you a little clip uh, where he describes this and describes some of the significance about this way of viewing building. Why wouldn't you like to see a human body, he asks, with a tail, with a curling tail, with a crest of ostrich feathers at the end, and with ears shaped like a canvas leaves? He's uh, making fun of buildings that have these kinds of features taken from other buildings. Why wouldn't you like to see a human body like this? Isn't it because it would be useless and pointless? Because the beauty of the human body is that it hasn't a single muscle which doesn't serve its purpose. A human body is beautiful because it's integrated, it's put together, and everything in it is selected to serve a certain purpose. And that's why it makes sense to us. And a building can be the same way, argues work. I want to build buildings like that. And so let's look at the human body and let's look at a building that is designed that way. This is a skyscraper that wasn't uh, ever built by Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright, I think, the best symbol of this kind of architecture. And I picked this one because well, it fits on the slide nicely and goes with the Da Vinci picture of man. Similar. But, you can, but think of all the, you know, thinking how the slide will be well designed. Anyway, everything here has a purpose in the building. Everything's selected to that purpose. And there isn't, you know, for example, a Greek portico on the bottom or some Gothic feature that doesn't fit in with the theme of this skyscraper. Well, likewise, a human life can be like that not just the body which grows for us automatically without our having to figure out how many arms and muscles we're gonna have. I mean, you can work to get your muscles better, but you don't grow uh, new body parts. Um, not just a human body, but a human life can have that kind of integrity, that kind of structure, that kind of purpose and directedness that a good work of art or a good natural, ob a well-formed natural object has. And Rourke does that in his own life. His life is directed around a purpose that he's selected for himself, just as he selects the purposes for his buildings. His life is about being Howard Rourke architect. That's the motto on his door. His mentor describes it as like something somebody would write over the door of a castle and go into battle for. It's a mission for him. And those words, Howard Rourke architect, mean not just, oh, I'll build buildings some way, but they hold, for him, the meaning of a whole way and a whole approach to designing buildings and a whole life centered and integrated around that approach with every part of the life harmonious to that, with everything working towards it so that everything in his life comes together and means something and reinforces the rest, just like every element of his buildings harmonizes with the others and reinforces the rest. And this life 
including the principles of architecture, is what Rourke sees as his interest, as his self. This is what he would have written in response to the first question on my assignment. We meet him at the beginning of the novel while he's still in school, and he says what he wants out of life. And we see in pivotal scenes in the novel him regarding this as what's good for him. This is his self-interest. When he has to give up other things, or when he's faced with the choice of getting more money, more fame, a more comfortable life, or straying from his, but, but to do it, he would have to stray from his view of what the career that he wants is. He stays despite you know, having to do really hard work uh, and suffer in a lot of cases. He stays with what he wants out of life, with his vision, with his Howard Work architect and what that means to him. <laughs> And importantly, he regards doing that, even in the most difficult circumstances for him, as selfish, as serving his self, not as renouncing. He's doing something that's principled. He's taking moral stands, like you're on last night. I don't want to give away the book for people who haven't read it. But he's doing things that are examples of integrity. He's taking moral stands but he's not regarding doing that as something that puts a limit on what would be good for him, as a stop sign he has to obey. He's regarding that as not letting other things put a stop sign in front of him, not letting conventions or what other people want or what seems easiest put a stop sign on doing what's really best for him, namely leading this life. And he sees his principles, his principles in architecture and his principles in life, as not a stop sign against his self-interest, against his desires, against what he wants and, and knows is good for him, but rather as the means by which he can know and understand what's best for him. Integrity is a big part of that means. Integrity is a major principle in Rand's morality. But why do we need such principles? Why do we need a code of values? Why do we need integrity and other virtues? Why do we need to be Rourke-like? This is a question that Rand addresses in Atlas Shrugged and in some of her subsequent nonfiction. And this is what I'd like to spend the rest of our time on today. Why do we need to live a certain way rather than another? If we need morality, as Rand thinks, not as a stop sign to prevent us from, to stop us from, to hold us back from doing what's best for us, why do we need it? In some sense, she thinks to discover, and in another sense, to come up with and create the kind of a purpose for ourselves, something for our lives to be about, to form ourselves, our eyes, to become someone who knows how to want or desire. Why, though, why do we need that? What makes that good for us? Indeed, what makes anything good for us? Why is it that there's such a thing as being good or bad in the first place? Well, to answer this, Rand thinks back to life. We had this analogy between a living thing's body, between the type of life that a person with integrity lives, and between an artistic work. Let's think of life, and let's think of it in a kind of fairly straightforward sense. Let's think about a tree, which has all its parts selected to, its, to a purpose, which is an integrated whole in the way Rourke thinks. And think about everything the tree does I mean, if you look at a tree, it doesn't seem that busy, but there's a lot going on in it, right? It's growing roots reaching down into the soil, growing leaves in a trunk that reaches out into the sun. If you zoom in and think about its metabolic processes, it's constantly busy, water being sucked up, sap and photosynthesis, and things are happening in the tree. A tree is busy. When those things aren't happening, it's not a tree anymore, right? It's dead. Think of all the different components that are part of the life of the tree. Because the life of the tree is a sum of many different activities that are going on in the tree. But they're not activities that are going on at random. They're not pulling in different directions. They're activities that add up to something, to the life of an oak tree in this case. It's a whole. It's a process, as Rand puts it, of self-sustaining, self-generated action. A process of keeping itself alive as the kind of thing that goes in this process. And if we study trees, we can think about what that process is. What's a tree life as opposed to another kind of life? Let's look at another living thing. Since we have an oak tree here, let's look at someone who deals in acorns. We have a chipmunk 
So think about a chipmunk's life and the different parts of it. Here we have the chipmunk getting an acorn, and cheeks, you know, they pull the acorns in their cheeks and they bring them back into their little burrows and they build up a little stockpile of acorns in their burrows and they go into the burrow in the winter and they sleep there. At some point maybe, you know, uh, they mate with another chipmunk, maybe they bring up the chipmunk babies, one of them, the mother has to nurse them because they're mammals. Think about the whole life of a chipmunk. Think about all the different actions that the chipmunk takes and how these fit together to form a certain kind of life, a chipmunk life. That has the kind of purpose, the unity, the structure that a body does, not just the chipmunk's body, but the chipmunk's actions that it takes because it, you know, as it moves through the world. It adds up to this chipmunk life. But now why does the chipmunk take the actions? The tree, well, there's something in its genes or whatever that just makes its roots grow a certain way in response to whatever kind of stimulation uh, is there, R roots going down towards the gravity, towards water. There's some kind of detecting mechanism, but it's some sort of genetic program. What about the chipmunk? Try to think about what it would be like to be a chipmunk. Why does the chipmunk start hoarding acorns at the time when it does? I don't know exactly what it's like to be a chipmunk. I've tried, but, uh, but it seems to me that what must happen is it just finds itself seized with a desire to gather acorns at a certain point. Maybe it remembers how it did things when it was a child and its mother brought it up, or maybe just something about the light. But whatever it is, at a certain time of the year, whether it's built into its genes or it's triggered by certain memories and associations, it just finds itself attracted to some acorns and wanting to hoard them up. And so it gets the acorns and starts putting them in its lair. And then, you know, at a certain point, it gets sleepy and wants to stay in and eat some acorns. That's, you know, what it must be like to be a chipmunk. At a certain point, it finds another chipmunk good-looking and, well, we don't have to go into that. <laughs> but um, maybe the, the female chipmunk gets pregnant, has the child, it wants to nurse it. But it's acting in each moment on some desires that it has. I don't think the chipmunk knows when it starts hoarding acorns that there's such a thing as the winter that's coming and it needs to provide for it. Certainly when the chipmunk makes a move on the other chipmunk, it's not aware of the reproductive cycle and that this might result in pregnancy and a new chipmunk to raise, right? Uh, it just has a desire and it acts on it in the moment, which is fine for chipmunks. Um, but there's something in the chipmunks that makes those desires, makes what they want to do add up to that chipmunk life. And that chipmunk life is pretty much the same Wherever you find chipmunks, year after year, century after century, they just go about living that way, acting on desires that something has made, something in them, some mechanism makes add up to a chipmunk life. And it works for chipmunks. And in the situations where it doesn't work, if the habitat changes too much, if something changes, it stops working and the chipmunk dies. But now think about not a chipmunk life, but a human life. And think of the huge variety of human lives there are. Think of the different lives that people at this conference are leading, if you read the description of the different speakers. Philosophy professor, uh, CEO of an education startup, um, venture capitalist. But then think of the other careers you know, uh, that people have. Uh, think of what your parents do, of what your friends do, of what people you grew up with do. And then not just think of people in modern America, but in other countries, India, China, um, and in different times, a medieval blacksmith. Think of all the different ways in which people have lived, where you can think about someone and think that his life added up to something. You could understand what his way of life was. All the different vast variety of ways people have lived in vastly different circumstances where the lives aren't the same, except in very broad principle maybe, but the details of the life aren't the same. And also think about, for each of these lives, what holds it together, what makes it a unity, what gives it purpose if it has one. Because the chipmunk doesn't know when he approaches another chipmunk amorously what's going to come of that, but we do, right? And, uh, and that factors into our decisions about whether, when, and how to do that. We've invented birth control and abortion and planning, and you know, we can control uh, how our sexual desires, for example, relate to our reproduction. And in every other area of life, we don't just act on desires and not know what's going to happen. We make plans, we think of, or we can think of, how what we do fits together into a whole. 
if we are doing a job that we've learned and seen other people do in the past, like driving taxis or driving horses and buggies, and conditions start to change, we can think about why it is that we do things the way we do in our career, why they're changing and how we can change to, uh, to adapt to this new world so that we're not like the chipmunk who, when the world changes too much, just can't cope and die. But not only can we think about why we do what we do and how to change it in changing circumstances, we don't take the circumstances for granted, or we don't have to. We can think about why circumstances are this way and how they can be changed. So instead of just being a cabbie that adapt to the new situation uh, with Uber, we can be Uber. We can create a new way for transportation to go. We can think, can we have self-driving cars? Can we have a different type of life? We can think before the age of computers about a time when there's a computer on every desk and how to make that happen. It's that kind of thinking on this grand societal scale and on the scale of your own life that is what puts together a human life. That is what makes it not a bunch of random actions, but a purposeful progression, something that has the integrity of a life, of a living thing, of an artistic creation. It's reason, our minds, our thinking, by which we coordinate our actions, by which we think long term, by which we add things up and figure out what to do with our lives. Reason, as Rand puts it, is man's basic means of survival. For us, it's reason that does what whatever these automatic mechanisms are in the chipmunk and the plant that makes their actions add up to something, that directs them on a purpose. It's reason that in a human being knows how to want. And crucially, reason isn't automatic. It's not something that just happens to you in the way that a desire might just come over you or a chipmunk in a moment. Even the desires that come over you, unlike the desires that come over a chipmunk, aren't fully automatic because they're the results of the thinking you've done in the past. Your life is run by your mind. And what Rand is inviting us to do is to take ownership of that fact, to take ownership of our lives, to recognize that we are our minds. You, each of you, is your mind, and your mind is in your control. And you have the ability to think in a way that the other animals don't about what kind of a world you're in, what kind of a creature you are, and to come up with for yourself a life and then direct yourself towards that life. And morality for Rand is not a stop sign that prevents you from leading that life or tells you when you're going too far in doing it. It's the understanding that that's what you need to do if you want to live and the principles that tell you how to do it. So let me just say a little more about this. I'll read you a quote. Man has been called a rational being, but rationality is a matter of choice. And the alternative nature offers him is rational being or suicidal animal. Man has to be man by choice. He has to hold his life as a value by choice. He has to learn to sustain it by choice and to discover the values it requires by choice. If it's reason by which we live, if it's our minds by which we direct ourselves, rather than some automatic mechanism that directs us such that we're always going to do the right thing, the thing that will add up to a life and keep us around in the circumstances where we can and then when we're out of them die. If we don't have that, but we have a mind that enables us to figure out a life for ourselves in any circumstance or change the circumstances or almost any circumstance, that takes away the automatic safety. That takes away what a chipmunk has that it doesn't have to think about it. What it feels like doing is going to be right for it. But that's not true for you what you feel like doing isn't necessarily right for you. It won't add up to a whole. It won't be self-sustaining necessarily. If you don't do this, if you don't engage in this thinking, if you don't take seriously that this is your life and you can come up with something to make of it and think about what that is, you're gonna be moving, as she puts it in one place, on borrowed motions and borrowed time. You're gonna be doing things at different scales in different spheres of your life because you've seen them done in the past 
without understanding why they're done. And they're not going to support one another and they're not gonna support you. If you're lucky and things don't change too much, you might get by with it. You might not starve or die. But you're not gonna have the feeling of knowing that you're in control of your life. The best case scenario is that you waste your life. And of course, you can't be ensured that things are going to stay the same, stay comfortable, stay in a situation where the patterns that you happen to absorb when you were little keep on working. The borrowed motions won't serve you forever. Or you can't trust that they will. That's why to not be a thinker is to be a suicidal animal, to be an animal that acts at random. And it's just luck that makes it, that makes you keep alive. And that's not a situation in which you can be happy, not for a human being with a human psychology. You need to see your life as adding up to something, as having meaning. You'll be just flotsam. And that's why it's so sad. Again, it's not that people are all like this, they're all ratchet, there are degrees. That's why it's so sad that people don't have, don't have an answer to that first question. What kind of a life would you lead if you prioritized your own happiness, your own self-interest? What is it that you want out of life? And that they see morality as something that stands in the way of that. Because what we really need morality for, at least on Rand's view and on mine, and I hope I've made you think about whether this is the case, is to create a life we love. Let me just read you one more quote, or two actually. Man's life is the standard of morality, but your own life is its purpose. If existence on earth is your goal, then you must choose your actions and values by the standard of what is proper to man. And in some notes written to herself, she wrote, it's you, you set the goal and the meaning. The field of choice and the possibilities is immense. The only necessity involved is that you use the material as it is and your tool as it is, that you understand them for what they are before you choose a purpose. It's up to you to choose a purpose in your life, but you have to understand the nature of the world and the nature of yourself to do that. And don't call this a limit. This is what morality gives you, the tools, to understand yourself and the world so that you can set a purpose. But don't call that a limit. Because if you think of that as a limit, to exist is a limit. Everything is just what it is and can do just what it does. And you too. And that's not something that holds you back or limits you. That's what makes it possible for you to live, to be something, to be a person, to have a life, to be happy. There's more I can say, but I think we're out of time. So let's stop here. I think we have some time for questions. Okay, we're out of time for questions, but there'll be Q&As later in tomorrow with me and some other people. So we'll have time to talk about this. Thank you.